الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا مزيدا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد First, let me say before uh, we move, go any further, and I actually said it before, but I think it gets clipped out in the question and answer sessions. Uh, and it's actually directed to our virtual followers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you beneficial knowledge and make your journey in knowledge one sincerely for his sake. It's important to hear from you uh, and get your input pertaining to the level of how the booklet is covered. Is it difficult? Uh, are you with us? Are you following along uh, in a way that you understand? Because over here I can look at the faces and uh, see the level uh, that, uh, that, that they understand or not. And it's usually followed by a question and answer session. And just so you know, I personally read every single text that I get. Sometimes the answer is delayed and I ask everyone to forgive me for that. But I do read all of them. And out of the hundreds of questions I get, I have not been getting any that pertain to the level of the class. If it's because it's going well, alhamdulillah, that's what we want. If not, then don't be shy or intimidated to let me know what you think. We want it at a level where all levels can benefit and comprehend. That's the level we want it at. I do believe some stuff that is mentioned in the class uh, and even though it's a booklet for beginners, Al-Usul Al-Thalatha is a Tawheed booklet for beginners. Uh, some of the stuff that we say when we do the explanation is a little bit further than beginners. And really the explanation, I believe, encompasses beginners and uh, uh, upper level students of ilm. What, what's learned here makes plenty of stuff and when we study other, other sciences in the future, it makes it much easier when we mention and elaborate as we do. And that's why I do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all beneficial knowledge. And let, let's take a quick summary before we start of this chapter, of the past few classes. A very quick one-liner uh, per paragraph. The, this is the core chapter. This is the chapter that mentions, if it's the core chapter, it's going to be the chapter that mentions the title of the book, which is the three fundamental principles of Islam. He stated the three principles, and he stated them in literally a one-liner, knowing Allah, knowing the deen, knowing the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa Then he went on to elaborate after that. He started with the first one, which is what we've been talking about so far. Who is your Lord? And after he answered that with proof, he answered... Who is your Lord with proof? Then the next paragraph is how do you know your Lord? And that's when we spoke, if you remember, about the signs and the proof. So on. Then, so no one will think, as it may appear, that the Lord, the Creator, the Nourisher, is sufficient alone, as it may appear. He ties into Lordship. He ties worship into Lordship. Because if you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the grave, knowing he's the Lord, as it may uh, appear, and some may assume, based on the question, man rabbuk, if one believes that, 
Yet he does not single him out in worship, in uluhiyya. Your lordship is not valid. So he tied the worship into the lordship in how we covered in the last classes. Now after that, he went down to give examples. It's essential that he gives examples on how to single Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our worship, which is part of lordship. He mentioned, as we said last class, the rule of worship, which is Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, the first three examples. Then he gave 14 additional examples. Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and then he gave 13, 14 more examples. These are examples to show that you must single out Allah out in your worship. These are not all the ibadat or even close to that, but they're mere examples to give you the general idea. That's the summary of this chapter so far and the order of the author and why he is mentioning this is important. That's why you need to uh, all bring your copies all the time. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. Okay, man rabbuk we mentioned is deeper than what many assume. It includes uluhiyya. And now he's given us examples of uluhiyya. And we left off last week on the first three examples. Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And we didn't elaborate as we usually do. We didn't take one by one and elaborate on them. Why? Because the author is going to talk about these three in more detail in the future. And our explanation has to coincide with the structure of the book. Here, he mentioned them as merely quick examples for something, for a certain purpose. So it would be more appropriate to elaborate on them when he mentions them in more depth later on. The author mentions 14 examples. Then, pay attention to this. He gives 14 examples quickly, right after each other. Then there's a paragraph. Then he repeats the examples with proof. So for our purposes here, what I want you to know is, instead of going over them twice, we're going to go over them once, and we'll include the proof. Instead of just mentioning them quickly and elaborating about them, then mentioning them again with proof, we just mention them one time and include the proof. Why does he do that? Because you notice his trend in, the, in, in writing this book is he summarizes, then goes into detail. He mentions the examples, then gives a paragraph, an overall paragraph of some proof, some ayat, and then he repeats them with every single one of them with proof. That's what he did with Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. He mentioned them quickly, then he elaborated on them. What we'll do is take each one, and as we speak about each one right now, we'll include the proof that he's going to include later on. That way we don't have to go over them twice. Why did he repeat them with proof? He mentioned them, then he repeated them with proof. Because what, what do we say about these are examples of ibadat? And ibadat are tawqifiyya, means you need proof for every ibadah you do. And that's why he mentioned and singled each one of them out with proof. So let's go through them, uh, through the list. Uh, what he mentioned is Ibn Kathir's statement. He mentioned Ibn Kathir's statement, rahimahullah, the one he said, the creator of these things is the one who deserves to be worshipped. The creator of these things is the one who deserves to be worshipped. And then he said, وَأَنْوَاعُ الْعِبَادَةِ الَّتِي أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِثْلُ الْإِسْلَامِ وَالْإِيمَانِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَمِنْهُ الدُّعَاءُ وَالْخَوْفُ وَالرَّجَاءُ وَالتَّوَكُّلُ وَالرَّغْبَ وَالرَّغْبَ وَالْخُشُوعُ وَالْخَشْيَ وَالْإِنَابَةُ وَالْإِسْتِعَانَةُ وَالْإِسْتِغَاثَةُ وَالْإِسْتِغَاثَةُ وَالذَّبْحُ وَالنَّذْرُ وَغَيْرَ ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَنْوَاعِ الْعِبَادَةِ الَّتِي أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا All these types of worship that he mentioned are mere examples, they're not all of them. And he mentioned Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Then he went to mention 14 other ones. He mentions 14 other ones. And we're going to start with the first one that he mentioned. Dua. The first one is Dua. He says in your booklet, وَمِنْهُ الدُّعَاءُ وَمِنْهُ الدُّعَاءُ And from that is invocation and supplication. And from that is invocation and supplication. Invocation supplication is Dua. Then later on, he mentions proof for that. Like I said, he, first he mentions just the word Dua. Then he mentions proof. What does he mention later on? After the paragraph of proof, he says, وَفِي الْحَدِيثِ الدُّعَاءُ مُخُّ الْعِبَادَةِ 
وقوله تعالى وقال ربكم ادعوني استجب لكم من الذين يستكبرون عن عبادتي سيدخلون جهنم داخلين so he mentions the verse in surah ghafir but he mentions first the hadith as proof for dua he says invocation is the core of worship invocation is the core of worship then he says in the evidence for that is the saying of allah وقال ربكم ادعوني your lord says oh people invoke me supplicate me making your worship sincerely for me alone and i will answer you and I will pardon you and give you. Those in Aladina Stakbiruna and Ibadati, those who disdain to worship me, in Aladina Stakbiruna and Ibadati, Ibadati is those who disdain to worship me alone will enter hellfire and disgrace. That's in Surah Ghafir. So the first one he mentions for dua is the hadith, the, or, or, or the supposed hadith, Ad dua u mukhul ibadah. Mukh literally means brain in Arabic. Dua is the brain. Of worship. Your brain is your core. So when you use it in a context like this, it means not the literal brain, but of course, but the core of something. Here it means if there's no dua in your ibadah, then the core of your ibadah is missing. This hadith right here, dua, ad dua mukhul ibadah, is in Sunan al Tirmidhi and the authority of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an. However, it's weak. Because in the chain is a man called Abdullah ibn Luhayya, and he's uh, classified as weak for bad memory. There's some stipulation for his hadith being accepted, but it doesn't fall under this hadith. So this hadith is weak. There's another hadith in Musnad Ahmad, Abu Dawood, the Tirmidhi, and others, on Nu'man ibn Bashir. It's very similar in wording, not exact, but very similar. But the, authentic, the chain of authenticity is, uh, is authentic. It's also in, uh, in, uh, in Bukhari, in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, and uh, uh, Ibn Abi Shayba, and others narrated the hadith. Al-Dua'u huwa al-Ibadah. The authentic one is, Al-Dua'u huwa al-Ibadah. Invocation is worship. So we say the first hadith, the one that's used by the author, Dua is the brain of Ibadah, that's weak. That's weak in its chain, but it's authentic in its meaning. Because we have another hadith that substantiated, it. so it's weak. The second authentic hadith is dua is ibadah. Uh, dua is an essential ibadah. You have to know that one needs a bond with Allah subhanahu wa taala that fills his heart with peace and tranquility, and that's dua. Look at the hadith. Inna Allah hayyun kareem yastahi idha rafa al rajul ilayhi yadi an yaruddhuma sifran khaybatin. If a servant raises his hands to him, to Allah in supplication, Allah becomes Allah, becomes shy to return them empty. And even though some spoke on the authenticity of this hadith, the hadith of Allah being shy to, to turn your hands away empty, uh, even though some spoke about it, the correct opinion is it is, it is authentic. Allah subhanahu fi ula is shy to turn your hands away empty. We don't have time to make this an inspirational lecture on dua because we want to get through our book. Even though dua is worthy of many independent talks on its own because many have neglected it. Dua is the core of your ibadah. Is the core of your ibadah. You get astonished when you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks people to talk to him and ask him and by not making dua you're declining the offer of Allah to talk to him. It's a blessing Allah granted you. It's a blessing Allah granted you. Use it. Use it in every status you're on. In your sujood. The hadith in Muslim. In your sujood, exert yourself in dua. The closest you are to Allah. And outside of your salah, and outside of your sujood, make dua. In your late nights, make dua. And in your daytime, make dua. During wudu, make dua. And outside of wudu, make dua. Do your dua, raising your hands. Do your dua without raising your hands. You can do dua in all your settings. Dua patches that deteriorating heart. It softens the heart and purifies the heart and the soul. And it gives you never-ending hope. Pure souls can never do without dua. It could be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it happens, for Allah loves you, He closes all the avenues in this life in your face. 
so you can open that communication that you've been neglecting with him because he loves to hear from you. Hopes and goals that you thought, you thought were impossible could easily become a reality but on the carpet of dua. Those who call Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, never get disappointed. We are the ones who need him. Subhanahu fi ula. We are the ones who need him. Yet he is the one who asks us to ask him. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Look at this verse. If Allah wants mercy over you, he inspires you to make dua. Thank him for that blessing. That in itself is a blessing. Dua rescued Yunus from the stomach of the whale. لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين from the darkness of the night in the darkness of the stomach of the whale in the deep darkness of the ocean Dua destroyed the people of Nuh فدعا ربه أني مغلوب فانتصر Dua raised the level and status of Sulaiman Dua made the religion of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم supreme The more the slave narrows and encloses and encaves on you with its hardships and trials and tribulations, the more a believer sees an opening in the heavens to the one who is over the heavens. Who could be more of a loser than one who misses out on the strongest weapon? The strongest weapon that needs no more than your set mind in a moving tongue. This establishes a clear principle. We said the verses come, the verses that start with يَسْأَلُونَكَ And if they ask you, or if they ask you, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ When you see them in the Quran, look at them, they're consistent. There's always, and tell them Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and tell them Muhammad. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ فَقُلْ قُلْ قل يسألونك عن الخمر الميسر قل يسألونك عن الأنفال قل يسألونك عن اليتامى قل يسألونك ماذا حل لهم قل يسألونك ماذا ينفقون قل يسألونك عن الساعة أيان مرساء قل يسألونك عن الروح قل يسألونك عن الجبال فقل وإذا سألك عبادي عدي there's no فقل there's no قل فإني the answer comes direct from Allah فإني there's not and tell them it's a direct answer from Allah why Number one, it's a hint that there's no mediator. It's to get it through to you. There's no me. This is a this is a relationship between you and Allah alone. Number two is to show you that the response will come from Allah quickly and swiftly, and that also to know Allah's love for your du'a. And you know, in this beautiful, let's pause at this verse a little bit. You know, in this beautiful verse. Allah didn't mention that he will respond in a third person pronoun. He didn't say it in a third person pronoun. And he will answer. Allah's response was direct. And I will answer. And I will answer. Another lesson in this verse. And there's many, many lessons in it. He didn't answer and say, I will answer if I will. Everything's under the will of Allah. Everything's under the Mashiach of Allah. But to give you confidence and assurance in your dua that it will be answered, he says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ أُجِيبُ And I will answer if he asks. Not if I will. To give you confidence in your dua. More amazing lesson in this verse is Allah said, He will answer on the condition that we make dua. On the condition we make dua. Usually the condition is mentioned First, then the answer or result after that. Here it's the opposite. They're switched around. The condition is, if one asks, if one asks, the answer to that condition is, I will answer. The verse should have really been, if one asks, I will answer. That's how it should have been in Arabic language. They're switched around in this verse to say, I will answer. If one asks or supplicates, That's to indicate the velocity of the answer and its power and its speed. Then, go on further. He responds to, in, to, 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 the, one, to the invoker. إِذَا He used إِذَا إِذَا دَعَان He didn't say إِن دَعَان 
He could have used in. They're both used in Arabic interchangeably. Iva and in are used in Arabic interchangeably. However, even though they're used interchangeably in Arabic, there's a sensitive difference in the sensitive rules of Arabic eloquency, which is called balagha. There's a sensitive difference between that. What is it? Why did he use Iva instead of in? Even though they're used interchangeably, and both are eloquent. In is used for matters far apart or doubtful to occur or exceptional to happen, or maybe even impossible to happen. That's when you use the in f, if, if, if da'an. That's when you use in da'an, when they're not going to happen. Look at, the, look at the Quran, look at the consistency of the Quran. قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَحْمَانِ وَلَدْ Tell them, if the Rahman had a son, does Allah have a son? Allah. Impossible. This is something impossible. So would he use in or either? He would use in, because it's something that's impossible, far-fetched. If not, never going to happen. So he uses in instead of إِذَا. قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ He didn't say قُلْ إِذَا كَانَ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ Another example. وَإِنْ طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُ وَإِنْ طَائِفَةَ If two groups of Muslims were to fight, what are you going to use? He's going to use in. Why? Because the origin is Muslims don't fight each other. It's exceptional or rare that they do fight each other. So once that happens, it's exceptional, we use in instead of either. Another verse. Allah told Musa, go look at the mountain. If it still stands, if it still stands still, then you'll see me. Is the mountain going to stand still or not? He used in if the mountain remains intact. Why? Why in instead of either? Because the mountain is crumbling. It didn't mean in in if it remains still. So it's not going to happen. It's not going to stay still. It's going to crumble. So he used in. Just like in for, uh, in for, for Rahman. And uh, in for the two groups of Muslims who fight because it's exceptional. When it's unlikely to happen or doubtful or impossible, it's more eloquent to use in instead of either. Uh, let me give you another example. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ It's prescribed upon you. When death approaches any of you, it's talking about death. If death approaches you. Now, which one are we going to use here? In or either? If death is far-fetched, it's not going to happen, then we'll use in. If it's imminent and surely going to happen, or more likely, we we'll use either. Let's read the verse again. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ إِذَا is suitable here because every one of us is going to die. You see, that this is a, 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 a balagha uh, issue with in, 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 إِذَا وَتَرَى الشَّمْسَ إِذَا طَلَعَتْ تَزَاوَرُ عَنْ كَهْفِهِمْ You will see the sun declining to the right of their cave. Does the sun rise upon them every day? If the sun rose every day, it's certainly going to happen every day. What would we use? In or إِذَا وَتَرَى الشَّمْسَ إِذَا is the sun rise every day? If the sun is not likely to rise every day, we'll use in. If the sun is going to rise eminently every day, we're going to use either. Let's read the verse. وَتَرَى الشَّمْسَ إِذَا طَلَعَتْ Of course, the sun arises every day. So we're going to use either. Now, more so you understand this. Is the judgment day imminent or impossible? Uh, or uh, Im Possible? or eminent, or something that is far-fetched, not going to happen. If it's eminent, we use either. If it's not, we use in. That's how we distinguish between the two. If it's eminent to happen, we use either. If it's doubtful, questionable, not likely to happen, we use in. Even though both are used interchangeably, uh, uh, and both are correct. However, that's a delicate balagha uh, issue. In the Quran comes in that, like we always say, in the most eloquent of the Arabic language. A random writer in a book would use them interchangeably. You won't tell him this is wrong, this is right. One who had in-depth study of balagha will use them in the more, more appropriate usage. In the Quran, comes in the most eloquent of the Arabic language. And that's a detail to keep in mind. Go back to that uh, issue of the judgment day. 
The verse is talking about the judgment day. Is the judgment day impossible or possible? Is it more likely to happen or not? All the judgment day verses mention إذا because it's eminent. إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها إذا وقعت الواقعة إذا الشمس كورت وإذا النجوم انكدرت وإذا الجبال صير إذا إذا The point of that is when إذا was used it was used to assure that your dua will be answered. The usage of إذا instead of in in the verse إذا دعان is to show that it's imminent that your dua will be answered. He didn't want you to have he put everything in that verse. Everything in that verse to show you and remove any doubts in your heart that your dua is going to be answered. Another unique thing about إذا and in over here إذا دعان is to show that إذا دعان إذا the usage of إذا shows that not only will dua be eminently accepted for sure but there needs to be lots of dua and all your dua will be accepted why because either comes to mean a lot comes to mean a large quantity either also has preference over in in that it's all used for large quantity look at that in the quran when allah talks about wudu he says قمتم إلى الصلاة فاغسلوا وجوهكم. and then he says وإن كنتم جنبا. when allah talks about wudu Wudu is something you do a lot frequently. You might have to do it five, maybe ten times a day. Either. It's either. Either. Either when it's talking about wudu. When he talks about the major impurity, Junub, he uses in and if. Why? Because the major impurity is less in quantity that you do in wudu. You see that? You're likely to do wudu five, ten times a day. More. Maybe. But taking a bath for jana from Janabah, the major impurity, is much less than that. Both mean F, in and either. But the eloquence, the balagha, gives you deep, sensitive, specific details that strengthen your iman and your faith that Allah will answer you. The bottom line, in a one-liner, is about either and in. They can be used interchangeably. Nearly most of the time. Nearly most of the time. Which mean... If or might, that's what they mean. However, if it's more certainly to happen, or it's certain to happen, it's more eloquent to use either. And a second difference, that's the first one. A second difference is, if it's a lot, either has preference over in. Here, number one, certainty that your dua will be answered. And number two, a large quantity of dua must go up to Allah, and a large quantity of answers will come down to you. All that in either. More lessons in that simple verse on dua. Ujibu da'wata da'i idha da'an. He said, Ujibu da'wata da'i. He didn't say, Ujibu da'i. He said, I respond to the invocation of the supplicant. When he calls me, the invocation of the supplicant. The invocation. I answer this invocation. Why didn't he say, I respond to the supplicator? He said he will respond to the supplication. But he didn't say, I will respond to the supplicator. Why didn't he just say, I will respond and answer the supplicator? He said, I will answer the dua of the supplicator. Because it doesn't matter who is invoking. Don't minimize yourself and say, Allah will not answer me. It could be Muhammad or Salih or Abdullah or Nasir. We're all equal in Allah's eyes. It's the dua that matters. It's the invocation itself that matters. It doesn't matter who's making it. Fulfill the conditions of dua, it doesn't matter who's making it. No one's better than anyone. That's why it's like that. The dua goes to Allah the same. Fulfill the conditions, and that's what you need to do. Ibadi. He said ibadi, and he didn't say ibadi. He used he said ibadi with a ya at the end. And it's different than ibadi with a kasra at the end. Look in the Quran, it's a ya at the end, not a kasra. Here he used the one with a ya. Ibadi, Ibadi, with a ya. It means plural. So many. Meaning I answer them all. No matter how many they are. That's why in the context of Allah, in the Balagha, you will find that ya, with uh, Ibadi, ya, uh, at the end of Ibadi, comes when there's a lot. When it means a lot. For example, when Allah is speaking to all servants, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي يَا الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا Yeah, there's a yeah. 
قل عبادي يقولوا there's a yeah because it's talking these two verses are talking about large quantity of servants the, 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 all the servants that's why there's a yeah at the end when there's a majority when there's overwhelming majority if it's not many that's meant by the verse you're going to find not a yeah but a kasra look now, when Allah was directing the servants, it's all the servants. Use the yeah, because they're all of them. Now, who's the righteous? فَبَشِّرْ عِبَادِ Glory to my righteous servants. فَبَشِّرْ عِبَادِ Glad tidings to those who hear and follow. فَبَشِّرْ عِبَادِ Who follows? A lot or a little? A little bit. So there's going to be a yeah or kasra? Kasra. Look at it in the Quran. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمْ Another verse. The muttaqeen. La or little. Not many, it's going to be a kasra. فَإِنِّي قريب, And he didn't say, he said, إِنِّي قريب, He didn't say, أَنَا قريب. He said, إِنِّي He could have said, أَنَا What's the difference between the two? The noon, إِنِّي مُشَدَّدَ Has a shadda on it. Na أَنَا قريب. The one he used has a shadda on it. That's to affirm something. I'm not near. I want you to make sure that I'm near. To remove any doubt. To give you inspiration and confidence. Both inni and ana mean the same. However, inni with the shadda is to add extreme emphasis that he is near. Don't have no doubt about that. Have confidence. All these lessons in just a few letters of the Quran asking you to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assuring you that your invocation with its condition, if its conditions are met, will be answered. Look, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ Allah heard the statement of خَوْلَ بِنْتْ ثَعْلَبَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا The one who disputed the Prophet ﷺ came to speak to the Prophet ﷺ concerning her husband. خَوْلَ comes complaining to the Prophet ﷺ In a room that's nearly 10 feet by 11 and a half feet. Imagine that, a room 10 feet by 11 and a half feet, approximately 3 meters by 3 and a half meters. She's sitting there with the Prophet ﷺ and Aisha. Aisha in that room, in that small room, couldn't hear what that woman is saying. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on top of seven heavens said, Qad sami'a, Allah heard her. Aisha couldn't hear her. In that small tight little room, Allah on top of seven, seven heavens heard her. Keep dua for yourself personally, for your family, for this ummah, for your akhirah, for your dunya. Keep it fresh and ripe on your tongue. Some people ask, especially about the ummah situation, why hasn't Allah answered the dua of this ummah? You get that question, I get that question a lot. And let me say, when the Prophet وسلم, made dua in Badr, when did he make dua? The, when, when the Prophet وسلم, the messenger's upper garment fell off in Badr, his hands were outstretched to the point that they could see his armpits making dua. And Abu Bakr is holding up his garment saying, O Prophet of Allah, Allah will grant you that which he promised. He's trying to calm the Prophet وسلم, when, he, when did he make that dua? That was after he وسلم, did all the means before him. He did all the action he could do. Then he turned and made dua. The dua was towards the beginning of the after he did, took care of all the means. Even more delicate than that. Look at the verses that, Allah, that, that the Prophet ﷺ used to wake up to every single night. The verses he used to wa wa uh, wipe his blessed face ﷺ and recite them. They have five main dua in them. So at the end of Surah Ali Imran, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. Rabbana inna ka man tudkhil. Rabbana inna na sami'na. Rabbana faghfir lana dhunubana. Rabbana wa atina ma wa'attana. Five dua, main dua in the chain of verses. Look what Allah answers when He answers. Allah answers, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ دُعَاءَهُمْ Is that how the verse goes? You, I made a mistake, yeah. That's not how the verse goes. فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ أَنِّي لَا أُضِيعُ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ Allah said, So their Lord answered them, I will not let any of their actions go in vain. He wanted to answer, He said, I answered their actions. 
I'm not going to let any of their actions go in vain. But that was supplication. It wasn't an action. It was a supplication. So why didn't he say, I answered your supplication? Just like the Prophet Sallallahu in Badr, because supplication without doing the means is no good. You can't ask for a child if you're not married. You can't ask for a son if you're not married. If our heart action is tainted, what victory? What victory are we expecting? One time, we have an ummah that doesn't know the difference between shari'i and shari'ah. They're willing to die for both and think that both of them become martyrs. Wallah al azim it blows a mind how nearly an entire ummah with their enemies, illa man rahim Allah, can bandwagon with each other against the righteous. And then, you think we're going to make dua and Allah is going to answer? When the heart action is not even there? The heart action is not even there. The most simple part of it. Then we ask for victory and we wonder why it's not answered. Before we get off topic on this issue, let's get back to our text. So the first example the author mentions is dua. We mentioned its importance. And how one must always keep uh, making dua. Uh, and it's uh, at the core of ibadah. And it, it, since it's ibadah, it must be directed only to Allah. And that's why the author here mentions it. He mentions ibadah. It's a ibadah, that means it has to go to Allah. Then he mentioned as proof the verse in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ ادْعُونِ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَنَّمَ دَاخِلِينَ this is the verse that often used as proof. In addition to the hadith that we mentioned, the one that's weak. Your Lord said, invoke me. Ask for anything. I will respond to your supplication. Surely, he will respond to your supplication. Those who scorn my worship, they will surely enter hellfire and humiliation. Sayyidhuluna jahannama dakhirin. First, we need to know the definition of ibadah. Al-ibadah, because we're going to base something on it. هي is كل هي كل ما يحب الله ويرضى من الأعمال والأقوال الظاهر والباطنة. Dua is a universal term that encompasses everything Allah loves, from sayings and actions, both internal matters of the internal part and external. It includes both obligatory, recommended, and mustahab matters. All that is ibadah. So for example, if Allah commands the act, that means it becomes ibadah. That saying or act that he commands becomes ibadah. If Allah commands the people of the act, it makes it ibadah. Even if he commands the people for the act, it becomes ibadah. For example, Wallahu yuhibbu sabirin. He loves those who are patient. He loves those who are patient. Because, why does he love them? Because of their patience. That makes, because Allah loves it, makes it ibadah. Because we said ibadah is a term encompassing everything Allah loves of sayings and actions, both internal and external. Another example. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ They used to hasten to do good deeds. وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا they used to call on us with hope and fear and used to humble themselves before us. They used to humble themselves before us. Once Allah praised hope, fear, and khushu' to him, which is humbling oneself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once he praised that, what happens according to our definition? Becomes ibadah. Once, okay, now that we're going to, through step by step. Once we know it's ibadah, then it means it's got to go 100% to Allah and to no one else. Ud'uni. Ud'uni. Wa qala rabbukum ud'uni. The author used this verse as proof. Wa qala rabbukum ud'uni. So we know we know what ibadah is. We know what happens when it's ibadah. Ud'uni. Dua istilah and the shari'i meaning of dua is what we talked before. The two meanings, supplication when it's requested, that's the dua al-mas'ala or dua al-talab. When you directly ask Allah, you supplicate and ask Allah like in dua, 
ذاتس دعاء المسألة أو الطلب يا الله يا حي ذاتس دعاء الطلب أو المسألة ذاتس the first type of دعاء the second one is invocation through worship دعاء العبادة which is every every worship other than the first type why because in, why is it called دعاء because in every عبادة you do you want something you're doing your عبادة you want a reward you want to be safe from hell you want to please Allah. You want to love Allah. So you're in reality, even though you're not directly asking, you're asking for something. Some ulama said every dua in the Quran encompasses both of those. Every dua you see in the Quran encompasses that except one in Surah Al-A'raf. Ud'u rabbakum tadarru'an wa khufya. They said this is the only one that means dua al-mas'ala, the direct dua. When you invoke Allah, Ya Allah. That's the, that, that's the only one in the Quran that they said. Uh, is dua al-mas'ala everything else in, in the Quran where there's dua encompasses both meanings when the author mentioned dua he meant dua of al-mas'ala when he mentions it here the author we know that from the context of the word he meant dua al-mas'ala that's what he meant he said and from the ibadah is dua from the ibadah is dua once he said ibadah then he mentioned dua he mentioned the broad one then he mentioned the narrow one so when he mentioned dua here from the context, you can tell it's dua of al-mas'ala. It would be redundant to mention it again, ibada, and then dua. It would be redundant to mention it. That's why we know the second dua he meant was dua of al-mas'ala. First he mentioned ibada, then when he mentioned dua again, he meant the dua of al-mas'ala. Otherwise, it would be redundant. The context clearly shows that. So the author here meant dua of al-mas'ala. Because of him mentioning ibada and then dua. Uh, now going back to the verse وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Some ulama said dua here in this verse is the dua of a talab the supplication dua when you ask Allah the first one we took why? they said because he said أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ I will answer you because he said make dua I will answer you so if he will answer that supplication that means that's the dua of talab. That's the dua of al-mas'ala. However, really, uh, the dua here in this verse also includes the dua of ibadah. Meaning all other forms of ibadah. But if it's so, how do we answer to? Astajib lakum. What it means is, if it includes all types of dua, all ibadah, would mean I'll respond to you by rewarding you. And if it's the dua, the dua, I'll answer you by giving you what you want. If it's dua al-mas'ala. If it's the dua al-ibadah, I will answer you by giving you the reward. So in reality, the verse encompasses both. It's uh, the verse in the way it's, it's uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worded it, encompasses both. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَةِ سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ those who scorn my worship will surely enter hell in humiliation. The author mentioned this verse as proof for dua. Allah said, Those who are arrogant, those who scorn my worship. My, look at that. That's the point of that. This is why. Those who scorn my worship. What did Allah call ibadah? Dua. Worship. Those who scorn my worship. Those who score, scorn my worship. So what, what worship is he talking about? Dua. So once it became ibadah, once dua became ibadah, it must be totally for the sake of Allah. And if one does it for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if one does dua for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he's a mushrik kafir. Now, let's take the categories of asking other uh, than Allah. First of all, a, a, a dead person. Asking the dead person is shirk. One who asks a dead person is mushrik. Under no condition do you ask the dead. That's shirk. And if the dead is in front of you, it's shirk. If the, a, if the dead is in front of you, it's shirk. B, if the dead person is not present in front of you, meaning you're asking him at a distance, it's still shirk. Dua to him uh, is belief that he has control over the world and he's dead. And that's shirk. Asking a dead is automatic shirk akbar. 
even if asking them is that which they could have done when they were alive. Now if it's, he's alive, this is a dead person, it's very simple and easy. If he's alive, it's three scenarios if someone is alive and you ask him. If you ask a person alive, give me food, hand me that dish, give me water, uh, that's permissible. It's before him, he has the means, the means are there, he has control over it, he has the abilities. Allah granted him the abilities, you know he granted them the abilities, so you can ask him. If he's before you and he can hear you and he has the abilities and means, you can ask him for what he's able to do. Hand me the water. Hand me your phone. Help me fix the house. Help me with my car. That is permissible. That's A. For a person who's alive. B. If what you ask him is beyond his power and abilities. Like powers only Allah has. That's shirk akbar even if he's present in front of you. Example. I go to a sheikh. Or someone goes to a sheikh. And tells that sheikh, bring down the rain. Or cure my ill. He's not a doctor, he's not, you believe he has spiritual powers. Cure my ill. Or sheikh, uh, uh, bless my wealth. This is shirk akbar. The third one, see, for the one living, if he is living, not present, you can't ask him what he can or can't do. That's like asking the dead. Now, we don't mean present as in right in front of you. If you ask someone on the computer or phone uh, through means of communication, uh, that's like as he's present in front of you. Uh, if you ask him on the computer, help you with a program or, or with some uh, matter, that's, that's, that's permissible. What we mean is like someone is in Africa and you're in the United States and you tell them to give you a cup of water. He's not in front of you. There's no means of communication. He can't do How's he going to give you a cup of water? That is improper. You can't do that. That's shirk. That's shirk. Why? Because even though it's in his power to give you a cup of water had he been present, in reality, you gave him power of hearing that only belongs to Allah. I'm here. I say, Sheikh so-and-so in Africa, give me a cup of water. There's no internet. There's no phone. There's no nothing. How, how can he hear? Unless I gave him the power the quality that only belongs to Allah, the all hearing. Now, let's take a mas'ala. Is asking jinn shirk? Is asking a jinn shirk? Now, first of all, if it's a jinn who can hear you, you can see him and you can, he can hear you, that doesn't fall under shirk. Why? There's a story in al Nasa'i, Ibn Habban, in Bukhari mentioned in the Tariq al-Kabir. No, it's not in Sahih Bukhari, in the Tariq al-Kabir. Ibn Hibban considered authentic. Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu an had a pile of dates somewhere stored. And he noticed it kept going missing. One night, he seen some type of creation. He, seen, he resembled it to a younger boy. Ubay gave him salam. And the boy, the creation like a boy, returned the salam. He said, Ubay said, are you human or jinn? The boy said, I'm jinn. Obey said, show me your hand. He showed him his hand and it was like that of a dog or, and it had the hair of a dog on it. Obey said to him, uh, why do you keep stealing from our dates? And the jinn replied back, he said, we heard you love to give charity, so we wanted to take so Allah can reward you. We wanted to take from that so Allah can reward. Obey said, what keeps you away from us? And the jinn said, Aytul Kursi is what puts a bar barrier between us. So he left. Ubay went to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, Sadaq al-Khabith. Sadaq al-Khabith. Now, asking the jinn what's in their ability, he asked, Ubay asked him, if you see him, you ask him something like that, or you ask him for direction, that's not shirk. But it's a disputed fiqh matter if one can ask a jinn or not. That's if they're present, and if you see them. It's not our topic, but it's a fiqh issue. The correct of two opinions is it's not permissible. There's no need to communicate with the jinn and ask him like that. But it's not a shirk. If he's present in front of you and you see him and you know he's, he's there. Number B, if you ask a jinn what they can do, what only Allah can do, like cure me, that's shirk akbar. وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهَقًا Verily, there were men, they were amongst the mankind, 
يعوذون برجال من الجن فزادوا وانه كان رجال من الانس يعوذون برجال من الجن فزادوا who sought refuge in the males among the jinn the jinn فزادوا مراق the jinn increased them in their transgression the jinn increased the human in their transgression what's, what's this verse when the humans used to go to a valley or a scary lonely place in their journeys they used to seek refuge not in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but in the jinn that made the jinn get arrogant the jinn felt superiority over the ants because they began to seek refuge in them so what's the conclusion what happened the jinn increased the mankind the ants the humans in transgression and in sin what, what, what it means is the jinn seen that the humans were afraid and sought refuge in them so they began to scare them more. Suddi rahimahullah said, a man used to travel with his family. And when he gets to an area to rest, he would say, I seek refuge in the master of this valley of the jinn, that he won't harm me or my wealth or my children or my cattle. That's what one used to say on his journey. That's what? يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ Qutada said when they used to do that, when they used to do this, seek refuge in the jinn, the jinn would harm them more. زَادُوهُمْ رَحَقَ Al-Thawri rahimahullah said, it means when the jinn seen them, seeking refuge in them, and they were afraid of them, they became more bold towards them. زَادُوهُمْ رَحَقَ Ikrima said, the jinn used to flee from humans like human used to flee from the jinn. They used to be scared of each other. Even the jinn were more scared of the human than the humans were of the jinn. But when humans went to the valleys and sought refuge in the jinn, first of all, the jinn used to flee. But the humans began to seek refuge in them. When they started to do that, the jinn said, they're more afraid than we are. They're more afraid of us than we are of them. So let's get closer to them. And that's when the jinn began to touch the humans with harm, like the mental things that they do, and the, the, the hardship and inflictions that they do. Zayd uh, ibn Aslam said, Rahaqa means when they sought refuge, when the humans sought refuge in the jinn, the jinn began to scare them more. Ibn Abbas and Qutada said, uh, it's sins. Zaduhum Raqqa means they, by seeking refuge, when the humans began to seek refuge in the jinn, meaning they gain more sins. It caused the humans to gain more sins. Uh, Mujahid said, Raqqa is tyranny, meaning the uh, jinn became more tyrants and transgressed more over them. L listen to the story. Ibn Abi Sa'b al-Ansari said, I went with my father outside of Medina when the Prophet وسلم, was first sent in Mecca with the early days of the messenger. We slept on the journey near a shepherd. There was a shepherd, he had some sheep. We said, let's sleep near this man. When it got dark, uh, uh, someone took the sheep away and ran off with it. Something took the, uh, one of the sheep and ran away. The shepherd ran and said, O oh, holder, O oh, guardian of this valley, I seek refuge in you. I seek refuge in you. The Bedouin is talking to the jinn. Ibn Abi Sa'id said, we heard a voice, but we didn't see from where it came or anything. He said, Sarhan, let it go. Let the sheep go. And the sheep returned unharmed. And then it was revealed, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِ It may have been, the jinn took the sheep. And when the Bedouins sought refuge in the master of the jinn, the master ordered the sheep be returned. Why? In order to lead him astray more, to give him more sins, to belittle him, make him a slave of his. And that happens. So that's the issue on the jinn. And another issue before we conclude this class is, uh, for example, if someone says, Wa mu'tasima or qum ya salah al din. Wa mu'tasima means like, ya mu'tasim. Oh, mu'tasim. The man who rescued the woman when she was violated, the Khalifa who rescued the woman when she was violated and rescued her, unlike the coward leaders of today, when uh, she called him, wa mu'tasima. She said, oh, mu'tasima. And he sent an army to rescue her. So now many say, wa mu'tasima. 
they say that, or they say, get up Salah al-Din, meaning when they see the miseries of the Ummah, it's more like a metaphor used now. Uh, however, there's explanation to that. Number one, if you believe Salah al-Din or Mu'tasim or even the Prophet ﷺ would benefit you like that and give you victory, that's Shirk Akbar. Number two, some ulama said if it's merely a slogan for a battle to inspire, it's merely used to inspire, like remember the days Salah al-Din, Abu Butain and other scholars said it's permissible. Now, then the third scenario is if it's a form, just a random form of expression outside the battlefield to inspire uh, people, uh, it's better not to use it because it may give the wrong impression for those who lack knowledge. Uh, and another issue, speaking to the dead in the context of a lesson, like a sermon, that's not wrong. It's not a, a, a lesson to not to the dead, but for those alive or for yourself, like Ali ibn Abi Talib used to do. He said, oh people in the grave, it's a form of sermon to himself and to others, reminding himself and others who may be, you know, the group who went with him. He said, oh you people in the graves, now you're... Uh, People live in your houses and your women have remarried and your wealth has been divided. This is the news I have for you. What do you have for me of news? This is Ali ibn Abi Talib talking to the dead. Then he said, if they could answer, he told the surrounding, if they could answer, they would tell you the best provision of is taqwa. taqwa. He didn't mean talking to the dead, he mean at a sermon. Another issue is speaking in the jinn as in calling them yeah format uh, 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 if you're saying that to warn them to warn them if they're there in an area you can do that in sahih muslim abu sa'id said the prophet وسلم, said in medina there's jinn who become muslim if you see any of them warn them three days if you see them after those three days then kill them they are evil they are devils that's you can say yeah to the jinn in that kind of circumstance. If you see or know for sure they are there. If someone assumes, assumes, then you don't use the yeah when telling them. I think the, the, the class is up, so we'll continue next week, inshallah. Jazakumullahu khaira wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.